Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. This is the Cube Silicon Angles wall-to-wall -wall coverage here. We're at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. Michael Rappa is here. He's a PhD and the executive director uh, uh, for the Institute for Advanced Analytics at North Carolina State University. Uh, he's a di distinguished university. Mike, welcome to the Cube. Uh, really great to have you here. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Dave. So. Uh, we're here at the, uh, the Information Quality Symposium. We've been saying it's kind of the bo in the boring but important category. We cover a lot of stuff around big data, and it's, you know, it's a hot topic, and everybody likes to geek out on all the technologies. But this notion of information quality is really starting to, we've talked about this earlier, Jeff Kelly and I, really starting to bubble up. Um, what's your take on all this? You've got a background in analytics. You're doing a keynote uh, this afternoon on the new data scientist, Hal Varian, you know, made that a very you know, popular term, and yeah. folks like Jeff Hammerbarker. So, where have we come from mm -hmm. in all this, and, and what's your perspective, what's your role here? Well, I'm, you know, as director of an institute, I run a fairly large educational program to, to produce data scientists, and we run 80 uh, students through a 10-month format uh, with some very clear objectives. But I, I think this is part of, of a very um, interesting decades-long progression we have going on mm. from really the electronic data processing, you know, doing things, not just recording it electronically, but storing it electronically in the 40s and 50s. Uh, by the 70s and 80s, we were amassing fairly significant amounts of data at that time. But then the web came along, tied together all those databases, and gave us even more data <laughs> on top of it. And now we're getting to the point where people understand that there's value in data. You know, we have, to, we have to do things to understand the data that we have, draw insights from it that we can make decisions around. And it, it's a very uh, value-added occupation in terms of uh, the ability to actually turn the information you have into an asset. Uh, I, I like to say that if it's not an asset, it's a liability. So if you're just holding data, not doing anything with it beyond processing it, it doesn't help you. Uh, I think that uh, the future is uh, being transformed by data now in an incredibly rapid way. I mean, it, it's just astounding. I've, I've been in this now, you know, almost three decades. Right, it, it, it is astounding. I mean, yeah. ever since we graduated from <laughs> my, our alma mater. We went to college we, together. We, we, we've, been, we've been hearing about how do we get value out of uh, our data? Where yeah. is the value? And so it and starts, with sudden, starts with quality. Okay. You know, so this Talk is a big, a important bit. issue, and that's why I'm here, because uh, data quality is at the core, right? So we collect all sorts of data. Sometimes, you know, we can run algorithms where we can deal with a certain amount of ambiguity in data and to draw useful insights from it. But the great majority of data analysis, at least, you know, up until this point, has relied on data quality and, and knowing that the information that we have in the systems is real. You know, I think uh, even today we work with a lot of organizations and what's amazing is, is that as you get into the realms of really large amounts of data, uh, when we were in college, you could flip through a few thousand lines of, <laughs> you know, on a spreadsheet. Even uh, later, you could flip through a few uh, tens of thousands of lines. You can't flip through a billion lines on a spreadsheet. And so you don't get to see your data anymore. You have to understand it in ways in which uh, you can uncover the the potential problem. And, and it is a real uh, common thing to see organizations not always understanding the problems they have with their data. And, and that's what we're trying to do, create people who can really help organizations better understand their data. And it starts with the quality, making sure the quality is there. So we spend a lot of time in, these, in various you know, big data conferences, and we were just at the Hadoop Summit a while ago, and you just, you hear stories that, that make you feel as though that emphasis on data quality that we've had for, for decades is, is giving way to, as you pointed out, algorithms and, and inferences and, and good enough. Yeah. So what are your, as a, as a data quality practitioner, yeah. what are yeah. your thoughts about that? Is that, yeah. are, 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 is that mindset in for a rude awakening or is there going to be a hybrid approach, a blending of those two worlds? What's your take? Well, you know, I, I think, uh, first of all, data cuts across the whole economy, mm -hmm. right? So we see it in virtually every indu industry se sector, whether it's private, public sector. 
And it, it really starts with what you do with data. You know, it's, it's the problem that you're focusing on. And certain kinds of data problems demand a ruthless type of data quality. I mean, you want to wake up in the morning, go onto your online banking system and know that it's right. <laughs> Unless they make a good mistake, yeah, yeah. I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but even that's, not a, uh, <laughs> not, even that's not a It'll good mistake. It'll come back to bite you. Yeah, so don't, <laughs> don't spend that money, please. Uh, so uh, but, you know, and, and other things, if you're dealing with the large, uh, if you're dealing with the West Coast, I tend to think there's an East Coast, West Coast reality around big data. I've written a little bit about mm -hmm. this. The West Coast is a little bit more dominated by the big web plays. And so when you're dealing with log files and you're dealing with tweets and, and other sorts of things, then all of a sudden the relative precision becomes different in terms of being able to draw insights about a user or to draw um, some sense of sentiment from tweets. You can start dealing with the probabilities and, and, and be a little less driven by the fact, or you have to, you're driven to because the tweets are human language and you can't possibly And false positives aren't life-threatening. Yeah, so exactly, <laughs> <Ab> absolutely, <laughs> okay. you know, absolutely the point. So, you know, I think what's interesting about this, and I don't actually like the term big data, I do believe data is big. <laughs> but the reality is, is that it's here, it's here to stay, it's accumulating faster than we even realize. People say, uh, you know, oh, data is so cheap, you know, we can just keep storing it. The reality is we're consuming it faster than you'd ever imagine. And unless you want your organization to look like, you know, uh, the Utah desert with, you know, 2.5 billion dollar data centers, <laughs> you're really going to have to come to grips with the data that you're collecting, how to uh, data reduction, data quality, making decisions. I think one of the most important things going into the future is going to be the decisions you make about data retention. Mm you know, data reduction. Uh, you don't, do you really need this stuff? If you don't use it, if it's not an asset, it's a liability. Mm -hmm. um, what are the governance rules over it? And beginning to make decisions about, uh, you know, uh, what is used on a daily basis, what goes into deep storage, cold mm -hmm. storage, right? You shouldn't be cooling petabytes of data 24 by seven if you're not using it. <laughs> That doesn't make a lot of sense. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, so, Michael, you're in the business, really, of educating, I guess what you might say, the next generation of data scientists. Yeah. And I think, you know, when people hear the term data scientists, they think of people like Jeff Hammerbacher and yeah, CJ Josh, Patil and doing some, yeah, doing some of the really interesting analytics on data. Yeah. Um, but what is the role of the data scientist in terms of data quality and data governance? Right. Because, you know, we hear, we also hear at the same time that, you know, 80% of the time, uh, of the time spent by a data scientist is, is getting the data in, in a format that it can be analyzed. Yeah, sure. So what role does the data scientist play in, in the data quality, the data governance, you know, maybe the less sexy aspects of being a data scientist, but sure. critically important? Sure, I, I'm still waiting to come across a sexy data scientist, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure how that's gonna turn out. But, Relative uh, term, I suppose. But I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, you know, if we called them data janitors, no, I know we'd have no students anymore, they wouldn't come into the scene. You know, the term data scientist is a bit of an awkward one. And I, I think, uh, you know, in my talk here, I'll discuss a little bit more about this. The fact is, is that um, there are, Jeff, you know, Jeff is a great example, there are others, and they have this unique combination of skill. They have the deep programming skill along with really good, solid math and statistics understanding. And they can meld those together. They're, they're I call them, they're sort of like Bigfoot, really rare in the wild. <laughs> you know, you don't see them very often. And honestly, it's not scalable. You know, there's no way to scale uh, enough PhDs in math and computer science or statistics and computer science. It's, no, it's not gonna happen in our lifetime <laughs> at all. And uh, even right here, we're at MIT. Uh, a, a few weeks ago, they graduated uh, their class and uh, out of about a thousand undergraduates, there were uh, less than two dozen graduates who majored in HCMC, which is math and computer science. And so, and, and that's at MIT. Well and that's at MIT, yeah. you know, and so this is not scalable. So how you look at the data scientist, I think, as you point out, is rightly so. It's really a spectrum of activity. The modeling part is just one piece of it. And so the, the and this is the most important thing, understanding the business problems. So the data scientist shouldn't be a white jacket person who's just running algorithms and cranking through data. Starts with a business problem. If they're not driving value by, by addressing a business problem and understanding the nature of that problem before they even get into the, the very difficult reality of um, uh, cleaning, integrating, you know, really understanding the nature of the data that you have, the distribution, 
all before the point that you get to model anything. And in fact, there's so much great work being done by uh, the, at the higher tier in terms of uh, the folks who produce uh, the statistical programming engines where so much intelligence is being embedded in those tools that in many ways, a few deaths go a long way. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I, and uh, a few of those guys go a long way. A few of those PhDs go a long way. What we need is battalions of people who are educated, like we do, I believe, at a master's level, who have the basic programming skills, who have, on top of that, understanding of the mass and statistics, but are, are much more like, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but universities produce more MBAs each year than anything. Okay, some 170,000, <laughs> it's an incredible number. We need those kinds of numbers graduating with deeper knowledge of how to deal with data. And we can do it at a master's level in fairly large numbers, and I think within about five years we'll see quite a large number of universities across the country turning out, whether it's 50 or 100 or more, uh, starting to really increase those numbers where people go in the organizations, they interact with the client, they interact with the business, they understand the business problem, they take what is probably the most difficult thing, you know, how do you, given the data that you have, how do you frame things in such a way that you really can address a business problem, draw insights, and then communicate it in a believable way to management, because management doesn't believe you. <laughs> well, <if> you <coughs> you're toast. It's not, nothing will go anywhere unless management <laughs> believes that you've done what you can do. Absolutely. And to your point about <coughs> the, the whole data science you know, graduates versus the MBAs, mm. uh, the, the financial payoff's certainly there. Well, you know, out in California, <coughs> kids coming out of college that are so-called data scientists, anywhere from ninety to one hundred and twenty thousand yeah. dollars, right out of the MB, uh, uh, right out of the, ma the master's programs, yeah. <coughs> and it's upside from there. But my question is, there's a th there's do you see competition? I mean, certainly there's this meme in the industry about the CMO is going to spend more than the CIO on mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm. You actually do see that competition in certain fields. And my friend Peter Burris, who's the head of the CIO practice at Forrester, is of course debating that Gartner stat. But nonetheless, mm -hmm. you're seeing large marketing organizations compete for those individuals, you know, throwing money at them. Is there a brain drain right now that's going to marketing? Like Jeff Hammerbarker says, the best minds are well, in my so, you know, generation. Well, so, I think this notion, you know, <coughs> of on the, the focus <coughs> on, you know, what is now more the conventional definition of a data scientist, a PhD, you know, has the program skills, has the statistics. Because they've been around for a while, They've right? been around no, a while, not, and new they, they are right. being cherry-picked <coughs> out of universities, which is, I think, a bit of a problem for universities. Mm. But I think the goal is is to push it down to the master's level and produce many more master students. Mm -hmm. uh, and we turn out now, you know, 80, 85 a year, and they're getting those 100K, you know, and up salary ranges with a, an intensive 10-month education. You know, a PhD can last you five, six, seven <laughs> years in the process. And and uh, you know, I think going forward, we're going to see a different kind of data scientist emerge. And maybe the parallel is with the MBA but with a very strong data focus. So I tell my kids, data is sexy. Maybe data scientists aren't sexy, but yeah. data is data sexy. Data is sexy. Data, <laughs> I'm with you on that one, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely there. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, in, a, in a matter of a few years, we're going to see that everyone is going to look through their organizations through a window of data. They're going to make decisions based on a much better understanding of where they've been, where they are, and where they're going, because they have a data lens on everything. We, my institute, we measure everything. We make decisions real time with data in hand, and so I live it as well as teach it. And I can tell you, I'm not going back to that other world. So we, we talk <laughs> a lot. It's a much better reality to work with so data. <laughs> there's a lot of talk about data-driven organizations. Do yeah. you see the emergence of, of data quality-driven organizations, or is that just too far afield right now? Well, again, for certain sectors, you know, in banking, in, in areas like this, Healthcare. it is, and, and yeah, in certain areas, it's it's always going to be a core issue. I think more what's going to come up is, you know, again, going back out to the West Coast with the big web plays. At what point do their attempts to go beyond click streams, you know, and and things happening there to tie that data to individuals, to other socioeconomic behavior, yeah, potentially, other sorts yeah. of things that that then all of a sudden maybe data quality starts to rise in the hierarchy of, of, 
of um, importance. Of That's a good point. Yeah. Clicking on ads could be a big, big predictor of, of other type of activities. That so, you know, if yeah. I was, uh, you know, younger and uh, coming out of school, you know, I enormous fascinating opportunities in places like Facebook and Twitter and others, not just centered on straightforward, you know, how, how can we understand where this person's going to click through something, but the matter is, is that uh, now Facebook understands more about human behavior than we've ever had in the history of, of civilization. <laughs> I mean, to go in there and really start to analyze some of the data they have and then start to wrap advertising around deeper understandings of that behavior is where the opportunity is going forward. And so just looking at Facebook, it's incredible the kind of research that you could mm. be doing in, in yeah, we, we mine Twitter pretty extensively as well. We haven't yeah. really hit the Facebook. And Twitter, Twitter is also yet, but an yeah. amazing and fantastic thing that, uh, you know, is, and, you know, these things haven't even been around five years. That's <laughs> I right. mean, yeah. I feel yeah. really yeah. old at this game here. We'll wait another five years and we'll see what you can predict with yeah, some of the information coming and out of social media. And that's where the yeah. speed of this is, chur you know, just churning so fast. It's, it's almost astonishing, you know, how rapidly data is consuming us and, uh, you know, we have we have to start producing people in larger numbers who can deal with this. Our students are are literally the most sought after and highest paid graduates of universities, and really some of the most sought after and highest paid graduates of any university in the country. And you know, we're, <laughs> you know, I I've, I've said publicly, and I've gotten some looks. If we can do this with 80 students, we could be doing it with 800. Right. I mean, the demand. We recently doubled from 40 to 80, and demand went up. Mm -hmm. You know, just deepened. Yeah, so tell us a little bit more about the program itself. Yeah. Um, you and I spoke uh, several years ago. Yeah. Um, I know you started the program in 2008. You mentioned now you're up to about 80 students. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how the, how the program has evolved over the years and, and, yeah. and what it looks like today. It's been a great experience. So I, I think what's unique about what we've done at NC State was is that we, we really started from scratch and, and really tried to understand what employers were looking for when they hired this talent and literally built the degree from the ground up, lecture by lecture, not just in terms of you know deciding, like we do more or less conventionally, like what content, what math, statistics, you know, computer science, business elements you want to integrate into it, but also through the structure of the program. So it's a very intensive, ten month experience. Students become completely immersed in the subject matter. Um, everything is structured around teamwork because teamwork is an absolutely essential skill set people working in this space and they they come out of it in very short period of time but with very uh, now fairly solid skill sets but capability to do things for the organization right out of the box mm -hmm. and so it's been a huge success for us we've had six straight classes graduating now to full employment uh, at as I said some of the highest salaries I mean it's, it's almost uh, you know, it really even makes me blink sometimes to see the demand factor for the skill set in it. But it's because they can do things. You know, they can join organizations, managers can put them on teams, and they can start doing things from day one. Mm -hmm. And that's what's needed. You know, you, you can't wait another two years to get your, <laughs> your data science effort going <laughs> or start making sense of your data. You've got to move and move fast with it. So the program's been great. We have great um, partners and companies like SAS work very closely with them to really bring industry standard tools into the curriculum. But we're, we, we really look at the employer as the customer, you know, and, and really, and, and that sounds normal to you, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? It's a typical thing for you guys <laughs> and for industry, but for right. universities, it's an alien concept. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, so how do you do that? How do you keep the pulse on what uh, the enterprise is looking for? Um, how, do you, how do you keep that communication going? Because as we're, we're, we're advancing so rapidly so in the types of data and the, we, the ways we, we want to use it. We interact, you know, consistently throughout the year with, with, with industry, with employers, both public and private sector employers. But we also have at the core of our curriculum, uh, in lieu of a master's thesis, a practicum, which is a team-based exercise that stretches over eight of the ten months. And those teams will receive um, real data from a sponsoring organization in large quantity, tens to hundreds of gigabytes typically, and they'll march through a very structured process of understanding the business problem, cleaning the data, doing the data modeling, preparing a report and presentation to their sponsor. And that keeps us very grounded. These are real problems. And if you look, if you uh, visited our, our website, you'd see we do 17 projects a year now with 
wide range of organizations from some of the world's largest brands like Procter & Gamble, GE, down to the Houston Astros, as well as to various government agencies who were had more data than, than Where do people go to get more information? What's the website? So uh, analytics.ncsu.edu. You can just Google, Google us as well and find us very quickly. And uh, you'll see the Institute for Advanced Analytics website there. We provide enormous amounts of information over the website about the program. Uh, we're very data driven and we share all that data openly about what we do. Uh, so uh, please uh, you know, visit us if you want to learn more. Certainly, Excellent. You'll, you'll find it more than a brochure. All right, Michael. Well, listen, thanks very much for stopping thanks, by the Cube. It's really a pleasure talking to you. And, it's and absolutely great to meet pleasure. You. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Great to meet you, and it's great. All right, everybody, well, keep it right yeah. there. Uh, go to siliconangle.com. Check out uh, the, the blogs associated with these videos. Go to youtube.com slash siliconangle to find these videos on demand. And, of course, go to wikibon.org for all the research. Keep it right there. I'm Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. We're live from MIT. We'll be right back after this. Doing great stuff with this. I really enjoyed it.